Hello, Sally Ann. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and being a guest. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to meet you and to speak to your audience about the role of the birth partner, which is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, and to be able to support others as birth partners in any way that I can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pleasure to have you on, honestly. So little introduction into yourself, if you could just explain um, to the listeners who you are, what you do, that would be brilliant. Okay, so Sally Ann Beresford, I am a doula. I am a um, birth keeper, if you like, somebody that is really, really um, out there trying to empower um, couples and pregnant people to have um, the best birth experience for them to almost achieve their dream birth. Because at the end of the day, we are capable of having positive birth experiences, but unfortunately, as we know from statistics, actually there are many people out there that aren't having positive birth experiences. And I really want to change that. And I know you do, which is why we do what we do. Um, so I teach antenatal courses. I teach pregnancy yoga. I am you know, involved in as many forums as possible. I have um, I'm involved in the Physiological Birth Club over on Clubhouse, which if anybody is listening, um, is a member of Clubhouse, come and join us on a Tuesday evening at 8pm. I joined the other day, I think. I joined that cl that club, the Physiological yeah, Birth Club. Yeah, it's great um, to be able to have that extra platform to support, you know, the knowledge that people need to advocate for themselves in pregnancy and also in their labour, because... You know, it's our belief that's where things are going wrong when people don't really understand how to own their birth, how to really stand in their power and uh, make sure that nothing happens to them that they don't decide upon. Um, and that's where the role of the birth partner comes in for me, because as an antenatal teacher, when I first began teaching, I started working with an NCT teacher and she said, you know, I'd really like you to come along and offer your knowledge and information to the course. And so I watched and observed where the information she was coming from was, you know, being taught and how it was being taught. And I sat back and I was like, there is nothing in there that really does help the birth partner apart from the acronym T-Brain oh. or brain, which is the, you know, the depends on who's teaching it as to what they say. Um, and that's a great tool and I love it and I use it myself, but it's not enough. By the time you get to the point where you're asking questions, you kind of lost it a little bit. You've kind of gone the wrong way. You're already heading down what I call the plan B route rather than what you started on was the plan A. So I helped her to rewrite the course to get rid of all the old fashioned information that really wasn't supporting the couples that were attending. And we sat down together and we rewrote everything. And from the moment we started teaching and including the birth partner throughout the entire um, course itself, but also having a whole session for them, we saw the results change. We saw wow. their birth experiences completely change and they were having much better times. There was less trauma, less issues overall. Um, and I decided to write a book about it so that I could um, give that information to more than just the people in my local area to give that information to as many people as I could. So I wrote um, the book, which is called Labour of Love, The Ultimate Guide to Being a Birth Partner. And I also set up a podcast of my own, which is called The Ultimate Guide to Being a Birth Partner, too. And um, being able to talk directly to birth partners about their role is is so valuable and I also feel the book is important for the pregnant person the pregnant woman to read because she needs to understand what the birth partner's role is as well definitely I you agree know. she I've needs to know how to let them be the birth partner yeah. I've been reading your book because you very kindly sent me a copy of it and it's I'm not quite finished I was aim so aiming to get it finished because it is honestly so interesting and I've really enjoyed it and 
I have already been recommending it to so one of my close friends she's pregnant it's her third baby but still I'm like you need to read this book and um, so I'm going to lend it to her afterwards because it is really interesting and definitely as well from being the person who's having the baby you still learn so much from what you're saying and I also get asked quite a bit from birth partners if there's any specific birth partner resources um, that they can go to that where they can get information that's aimed at them. So the fact that there's this book and your podcast, which is amazing as well, is so helpful for people. They really need it because they so often get forgotten. And I always say it on my courses, but the way that television makes birth partners look is like they're just idiots and they're telling bad jokes and getting everything wrong and things like that so it's understandable that maybe they feel a bit nervous and they're not sure what their role is as well so it's it's yeah. incredibly helpful and thank you for writing it because it's it's amazing and I'm going to be recommending it <laughs> to everybody now oh thank you yeah I think there's a lot of information out there about becoming a dad there's a lot of information out there about men that, you know, and the support that they need. And that is really, really necessary. Um, but this is a little bit different. This is about how to support someone through labor and birth, because if you don't get the birth experience right, actually, it has the repercussions for decades. Um, and both partners can end up traumatized not just the women it's often you know the, the birth partner too so making sure that you understand your role is is vital and I actually use a phrase a lot which is quite harsh um, but I say that the birth partner can literally make or break the birth experience um, that's a lot of weight on a birth partner's shoulders but as you know there is very little they need to do when birth goes well physiological birth is about doing nothing Actually, physiological that, birth, that part of your book where you say being not doing I love that it's so yeah. true exactly and so it's the art of doing nothing that I'm trying to instill in the birth partner encouraging them to know how to increase oxytocin by staying out of the way not being in the way. Um, that's the part that I don't think other courses get right because they're not going to birth. The teachers often, you know, the NCT type courses, they're not going to births on a regular basis. They've only probably been to their own birth. So they don't really see what happens in a birth room. And my intention is to bridge the gap um, to actually make the, the difference between the information they need to know about and what actually goes on so that they can um, grasp their role. I think hypnobirthing does a really good job of that because hypnobirthing talks um, about how to respect the body, the physiology. Um, but if, if somebody isn't embarking on hypnobirthing or they're not doing um, anything other than a traditional antenatal course, either with a private company or in the hospital that they're planning to give birth in, then they're missing some elements of what they need to know. And my book really does bridge that gap. It does fill in the information that will support them to achieve the birth that they really want to achieve because most people by the time they get to 40 weeks of pregnancy have a really good idea about what they want and unfortunately they don't often get it no the majority really which is is a shame but there's a lot going on there's people like yourselves and people really trying to educate and inform and hopefully we're going in the right direction of people opening themselves up to more information and more knowledge around it so there's some parts of your book that um, I wanted to discuss with you, some certain elements that you mentioned in the book. Um, obviously, I've found it all just so incredibly interesting and I could probably talk to you about every single chapter in it, but I won't because we'll be here forever. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, which I had never heard of um, before I read your book, and actually I think it's a fantastic idea. And I said, as I said to you before we started recording, it's something that I'm going to take into my own teaching as well there is the idea of a safety word. So can you explain what you mean by a safety word? Yeah, absolutely. So a safety word is something that you discuss in advance of birth. 
um, that you agree upon that if for any reason a pregnant woman who has sat down with you and said, I really want to achieve this type of birth, my plan A, if at any point during labor she changes her plan and she wants to switch to plan B, then she can look you in the eye and say, I'm serious, this is okay, I know what I'm doing, this is important to me now, and I need you to listen. And any other time that she vocalizes or says anything that may imply she wants to switch to plan B, you have full permission to completely ignore, override, and keep her going. So you have the responsibility of saying, you're doing really well, you know, and you are encouraging her. And if she safety words you, if she uses a safety word, you say, okay, I'm listening. What do you want to do? What element of the next part do you want to move on to? That might just be gas and air that might be getting out of the pool and going down to the labor ward and having an epidural that might be anything that you've discussed and talked about that is something that she's identified or it might be something you haven't thought of already but you bring in the midwife to the conversation and you say okay she's changed you know her viewpoint here what what can we do next to support her I love that. And also you used an analogy, which I really loved in the book, which again, I'm definitely going to tell people, but of it being like running a marathon. And I always, I mean, often labor is likened to a marathon anyway. Um, you know, it's an endurance activity and we need to make sure we're fueling ourselves adequately. But as with somebody who was wanting to run a marathon, if your partner was really set on running this marathon and they, their goal was to complete it, you would do everything within you to support them. And if at some point they ran past you and said, I can't do it, I'm finding it really hard. As you quite rightly say in the book, you wouldn't say, oh, okay, then let's just go home. You would say, you can do it, carry on, you're doing amazingly. And it's the same with with birth is that I'm sure for the majority of people, there'll be some point within their birth, in their labor where they feel like it's getting a bit much or they, they're not sure they can do it. And so if, birth partners are kind of allowing them to give in too soon then that's where you kind of get that danger don't you of them feeling disappointed afterwards so I love that idea and you know quite likely with the safety word if they were to then run past you at the marathon and safety word you then you would take them really seriously and, and say okay like yeah let's, let's yeah. go home so I, I, I love that analogy I think the marathon analogy is really really important because most birth partners are male and they do have a tendency to want to fix things that is within their characteristic you know their DNA they want to you know rescue you and most women don't need or want to be rescued in their labor they just want to vocalize they just want to say this is really really tough and it's okay for them to say that without expecting you to come along and scoop them up and fix the problem. They don't want you to fix it. They just want you to listen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think being able to safely vocalize, to be able to safely say, I really can't do this anymore. And have somebody say, you can, yeah. you are is all they need often. Um, and in, there's nothing worse than being in the postnatal period and having somebody tell you they, they have regrets about their birth choices. They have regrets that they did something too soon before they were ready. Um, and a safety word prevents all of that. Yeah. If you've got one in place as a birth partner, um, you are, you are, secure in your ability to keep them going to run alongside them if necessary to do whatever it takes to get them past the finish line unless they safety word you it's very difficult actually for a birth partner because like you said they they a lot of the time I mean sometimes they might have been at a birth before but they're not experienced in being at births and I completely can get how seeing somebody you love feel you know in look like they're in pain and, and feel like they're not coping must be so difficult that I completely get you'd want to fix it you want to make it okay and 
it's a real skill, I suppose, to for people to just sit and just be in it and allow it to happen. And you have to have such trust, don't you, in mm. what is happening and in you know the process of, of labor. And I guess that's why the education side of what's happening is so important that you do have that trust that your body is doing what it needs to do and everything's yeah. happening as it should. I mean, the birth preparation part is essential because if, if a couple don't sit down together and talk about exactly how she wants to be supported, then you're already on the back foot. You, you really do need to know whether she would want you to be um, touched or um, she would want you to touch her or she would want you to um, do anything in particular and I think even though that can change on the day you know I've had so many women that say I already I can tell you now I do not touch me in labor and actually they really need hugs and support and other women say oh I can't wait for a lovely massage and on the day are like back off that's not nice they don't know how they're going to feel but the least you can do is talk about what she thinks she wants from you and then you've got a really clear idea about how you can best support each other um and also about you know things like snacks and drinks and um what, what, what pain relief does she want in what order you know if that's something that you think okay I know she said she really wants an epidural then in that case when she starts to say she's not not finding it very easy it won't be a surprise to you if the very next thing she says is I'm done I want an epidural and therefore you can implement that really really quickly and easily whereas if you've got somebody that has said to you whatever I say I definitely don't want an epidural then you've got a different set of circumstances when she does vocalize when she is safety wording you might think okay how would I have that discussion with her what I would do as a doula is I would say I'm listening I can hear that you've safety worded me what I'd like to do now is just take a moment to discuss what we do next. Because if you are going to get out of the pool and transfer to labor ward, assuming that she's on you know, a midwife led unit or similar, then I need to know exactly what you want to do and why. It's more of a discussion rather than a quick action. So you need to fully understand her preferences in a way that you know you're not going to let her down by you know um giving in too quickly if you know what I mean I love that yeah it's, that's very good advice okay so another thing I want to talk to you about is the idea about negative and or negative versus positive control uh, because I found that also a really interesting part of the book so can you talk to us a bit about the differences between negative and positive control yeah so obviously um a woman likes to feel in control. And one of the reasons why birth can be traumatic is that she actually feel, feels like she's lost control. So talking about control in the book was very, very important to me because I wanted to ensure that people um, recognize that the control is theirs to own, that this is their birth and birth matters. And having the control, the ball in their court is essential so positive control is about choosing where you give birth who your birth partner is what they need to know that they've got that information have you written a birth plan got your preferences down that you can share with any care provider that comes into contact with you have you got all of the things that facilitate the kind of birth that you want those are all really really important parts of remaining in control but negative control is something that undoes your birth, something that lowers your oxytocin, that puts you in a state that doesn't facilitate what you want. So you're looking at the kind of overthinking, overanalyzing, things that really knock you out of labor. Um, and also, again, discussing with your birth partner what they need to notice about you if you're in that state, if you're overthinking. I, I mean, I have great examples. I have one client who 
was in labor for several days. And that first day, all she was doing was saying things like, have you fed the dog? Are the horses sorted? Have you got this? Where's that? And trying to get her to come out of that thinking brain was really tough, you know, really hard because you can't make someone switch off their brain. You can only wish they would. They need to be responsible for that. But as a birth partner, you can recognize if it's happening. You can see if that's what they're doing and think, I need to shut this down as much as I can. What can I do to facilitate oxytocin? How can I help her to switch out of all of that analytical mind that's going on? Um, one of the worst things is contraction apps. They're terrible. Um, people use them because they think that they're useful. They have no place in your birth. They only keep you in your analytical thinking brain. So ditch them, get rid of them. That is a loss of control. That is not supporting a physiological birth in any way. So if somebody is listening to this and they've got a contraction app, delete it off your phone. Don't be tempted to use it. Think about other things that you can do um, to really go with the flow of labor, get into the zone. And then your birth partner will be able to recognize when things are ramping up because it will be very obvious any woman can tell the difference between a 30 second contraction and a 60 second contraction without ever having to time it. Absolutely. It feels so different. It's massively different. And you can also use your breath. If you're, you know, if you're using your breath and you're moving and you're in a really lovely, comfortable position and you breathe three or four times during a surge and the next time you're four or five breaths it's already a bit longer it's already extending it's already getting to a point where it's starting to feel more intense and therefore you'll know yeah i think that's the thing as well with contraction apps is they're not they're not actually going to do anything they're not going to make it any quicker they're not really providing any benefit to your labor actually as you said that they might actually just make it longer because you're unable to relax and you're so focused on it and I think as well, when you get into the real nitty gritty part of labour, you don't you don't focus on that anyway because you're so within it, right? So you probably don't won't be able to focus on a on an app. So it's that beginning part, isn't it, where you really need to be so calm so that your your uh, labour can become established. Your book and one of the stories you had in it that really made me laugh was when you turned up to a um, couple's house and they were having a party in the kitchen and he was un unloading the dishwasher. Um, and her, um, not actually a party, obviously, but her labour had started, but had for some reason slowed down by the time you got there. And it's because they were in the kitchen unloading the dishwasher with bright lights on and all of this. And she was sort of entertaining you and making drinks. And so important. It's something we so don't think about, but you don't turn up as a doula and expect to be uh, entertained. So, you know, it's, it's so important that people understand in that first part their labor that they have to stay as calm and relaxed and switch off that part of their brain and as you said like birth partner can definitely facilitate that like just get out of the way like move out of the way and, and kind of leave her to it to a certain extent yeah I, I use that expression a lot don't turn your birth into a party like because you are you know never going to progress if you are in a situation where you're in that bright scenario that you've just described and you know really busy chatting it's you know it's the excited phase of labor yes it is exciting finally getting into labor but you don't want to stay in the excited phase for too long you want to progress into the serious phase the part where it really is starting to be become quite intense and you need to go inward so shutting the room down as quickly as possible and getting into that zone is going to help facilitate this birth to be as short as you can possibly make it which is ideal um, because it's exhausting and if you don't get into a nice comfortable relaxed state where you're softening the jaw the shoulders the fingers the toes and you're enabling that oxytocin to flow you really will be in that 
state of fight or flight where you are unable to progress and you will be exhausted and everything will go out the window. You know, when I go to births, um, when I go to meetings with clients who are having a second baby and I say, why am I here? Why do you want to hire a doula? They always talk about how that first birth went wrong. And when you pin it back, when you look back at what happened, it's those early hours that it did go wrong because they didn't see the benefit of getting into that state too early. They go on long walks. They have, you know, um, exhausting times where they're bouncing up and down on their ball to try and bring on the labor. And they're chasing something that they don't need to chase because oxytocin is produced in abundance when you are relaxed, when you're calm, when you're in a dark space, not when you're bouncing on your ball and going on really long walks. It's not produced in those environments. So you are making mistakes by doing that stuff. People definitely do chase labor. And I know you've talked about this before as well, but, and it's so, it's so natural. And I think I probably did it as well now that I like, I look back, but it's, as soon as you see any signs of labor, you're instantly on the ball and walking around and staying active, encourage it. But actually, like you said, all you're doing is just wasting energy when what you should be doing is just relaxing. It's going to happen on its own, in its own time anyway. So all you really need to do is just, is just stay relaxed yeah important point to make as well yeah okay so what are some of the top kind of mistakes that you would say birth partners make when it comes to labor birth partners make so many mistakes when they don't understand their role I think the first one is that they want to keep her company in the early stages when they actually really just need to leave her alone so if she wakes up in the middle of the night and she tells you that she's in labor, make sure she's comfortable and then go back to sleep and say, we need to rest because this is, we're gonna plan for the long haul and, and we're gonna make sure that we keep all excitement to a minimum. And so keep the lights off, don't get up and feel the need to do anything. If it's a second or subsequent baby, that is slightly different because obviously labor can be quicker. So if anyone is pregnant and they're listening and they are having a second or subsequent, then don't necessarily think that you've got, you know, all night. If you're planning a home birth, you might need your birth partner to get up and start filling the pool and then they can go back and stay out of your way or they might want to support you by putting a TENS machine on. There are things they can do, but the rest of the time, they need to be gone. They need to be in another room, leaving you to it. Um, so for me, that's one of the biggest mistakes is that they get involved too soon. The next one would be um, taking you to the hospital too early or calling in the midwife too early. Um, Recognising that... Um, especially with a first birth, that you need those surges to be consistently coming for a good length of time, at least 45 seconds to a minute, and having really consistent gaps in between. So whilst I would say never time it, never chase it, I would say as the birth partner, if you're worried and you think, I'm seeing these contractions coming really regularly now, there's another one there's another one, there's another one. Do get your iPad or your clock or your watch or whatever. Look at the clock and say, okay, well, it's 10 past. How many does she have in the next 10 minutes? And if you think that things are happening, prepare for the fact that you may be going in soon, but wait for her to mention it. Don't be the one to necessarily instigate the conversation and say, do you want me to call the midwife? Because if she's not telling you she's ready, she's probably not ready. If she is telling you, I need to go, I need to go, then say, OK, well, um, I'm just going to watch what happens over the next few minutes and then I'm going to let them know. And then we'll you know, make that make that journey then. Another thing is not knowing where anything is. You need to pack that birth bag with her. 
You need to know everything that's in that birth bag and you need to know why it's in there, what it's for, what it does and what you will be needing to get it out for. Um, very, very few items I believe are required. I often see couples schlepping through hospitals with suitcases packed to the brim of all these things. And then when you talk to them afterwards, they say, I didn't even open the bag. Always, always. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, thinking about what you really, really do need, what is essential for labor? How little can we get away with packing and why? Should it be only a few key items? I think um, that's very important to, 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 to know, you know what, what she needs. Um, what else do they get wrong? Too much talking, talking to midwives, too much banter going on in the background that they feel embarrassed that they can't say, I can't speak, sorry, she's having a contraction. You know, that they feel um, awkward in any situation. It's important to recognize that any conversations going on around a laboring woman can totally squash the production of oxytocin. And, you know, you don't want this labor to be any longer than necessary. So being quiet, being, um, you know, in the background, but not on your phone, not on your, not distracted. You don't want her to look up at you and see that you're not really paying any attention. Um, you want to be, that is that being not doing that yeah. we spoke about just now. You want to be present for her in any given moment, but not feel the need to actually physically be doing anything in particular. I think Those were my as well, that kind of chatting from birth partners is definitely like a nervous thing. Um, they've almost, it's one of those occasions where you feel like you need to fill the air with something because sitting in silence is a little bit awkward sometimes. So I can imagine that the, one of the reasons is maybe they feel nervous, but it is important to just be, like you said, sit, sit in the silence because that's what's going to help the labour progress the best it can. Mm -hmm. What, so as opposed to that, the mistakes, what are your top tips that you would give to birth partners then? Read my book. That would be my first. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only resource that's out there that's going to really help them to understand their role. And then take their role really seriously, because if you've got someone who's telling you that they want to have a water birth or a home birth or um, they want to have um, certain elements to their birth. You know, this is a hypnobirthing podcast. So I'm assuming anyone listening to this is interested in physiological birth or as, you know, safe and, and, and easy a birth as possible. Those are the reasons why people start to um, investigate what's out there so take that role seriously if she tells you she wants to use hypnobirthing get on board with that be involved in doing the relaxations the scripts that you know whatever the the, the techniques that you're learning on the course that you're doing be part of the journey recognize yourself as a key person in that in that birth and not just a bystander because that's when trauma comes in that's when things go wrong that lack of control that loss of control and as the birth partner you are so relevant to her you mean everything you are the person that knows her more than anyone else and if she tells you something isn't right or is instinctively trying to put something across it's your job to advocate it's your job to say hello we really need you. There's something not right here. Or actually, if the opposite happens where she's being told that something's not right and she's saying, I'm this is fine. Like, I'm absolutely fine. Then you need to advocate in another way and you need to say, no, she's great. Thank you. You can leave her. You need to understand why that's important. You need to know why physiological birth matters so that you can put a nice big support mechanism around her to help her to achieve the birth that she wants to achieve and bear in mind that 
medical professionals are there because they want everything to go well. They want your baby to be safe and they want your partner to be safe, but they don't know her. They've never seen her in any of these situations. You probably have, even though you don't realize it, even just achieving orgasm. If you've seen her face and you've been in a situation where you have, you know, watched her go through painful periods or you've seen her stub her toe and you know what she she does in each and every situation you will recognize how to support her through many of the situations she will be finding herself in during labor so take yourself and your role very seriously that's my key thing yeah they are you know the birth partners and the person giving birth are experts as well aren't they it's not just the doctors and the midwives they they are no one knows themselves better than themselves so they are definitely experts what would you, so just to ask you a question about what your advice would be in this certain situation. If you had a uh, birthing person who wanted to have a home birth, for example, they felt very strongly that that's where they wanted to give birth. But the birth partner, say it's the dad, um, wanted to, or didn't feel comfortable with that. Like there's something in them that they didn't feel comfortable. What, what happens in that situation? You know, what would your advice be for that? So that is a common thread throughout the entire book. Um, making sure as the birth partner, first and foremost, you recognize that anything she says to you about what she wants to do is never set in stone until the actual birth itself. So go with the flow. If she's saying she wants something that you're pretty worried about or scared about, don't squash it. Encourage her to explore her feelings about why that's important to her. And then as the pregnancy progresses and develops, you can talk about why you're concerned about the choice that she may be making that you're not on board with. And then as time goes by, you get to make a decision because, yes, it is her body, her choice, but it is also your baby and your partner. So you need to be able to understand that you do have a say but you can't actually put her in a medical condition that she doesn't want to be in and expect her body to work efficiently. You need to recognize that the power of the hormones that she's going to be releasing work best in certain environments. And if she is put somewhere that it won't be conducive to birth, you are effectively going to end up with a medicalized birth that she told you from the outset she didn't want so you have to take on board that that isn't ideal for your relationship that isn't going to work well for any element of moving forward as a parent so you need to really explore these deeply you need to start doing research into the statistics about the safety of what she's asking for and if you can't be on board you need to get someone in that can be a doula, a friend, a relative that wholeheartedly supports her decision because it does come down to the fact that it is her body and you shouldn't be putting her in a situation which doesn't feel safe or right for her. So there is an element of surrender that will need to go on if that happens. But what I would say is always be confident that no woman would ever put herself or her baby in danger. And it's when she is well supported in her decision making that often if there really is a medical concern, she will always switch to plan B because she doesn't want to be backed into a corner. She doesn't want people um, saying, you're making a mistake, this is a terrible decision and they're pushing her actually further into a corner. By actually being open and supportive that's when the right decision is always made. So, you know, trust her, trust what she's saying. A really good point about them, uh, you know, a person giving birth would never put themselves and their baby in danger. It's just instinctive, right? Like you just wouldn't put yourself in that position. So you just have to trust that they know what's going on and that they feel comfortable with where they are. So, 
just to kind of we've talked um about obviously birth partners in terms of being either the dad or the other parent of the baby I want to just talk to you just briefly about doulas so you just mentioned that now um about having a doula at the birth if the birth partner doesn't feel 100% comfortable what is a doula so a doula is a professional birth partner somebody that is um, attending births on a regular basis that is very well trained experienced someone who really gets the idea of what support really is and advocacy if necessary Um, ideally a birth partner would never need to advocate and so a doula would be the same you know but at the end of the day if there was that need they can support you through any decision making that you may need to to make um so a doula would be employed privately typically um by the couple there are doula services out there for people who have um you know issues that you know um, asylum asylum seekers for example there is a doula program to support women who may be in that situation but on the whole it's a private service that you pay for and you choose the doula who comes to support you and they get to know you in the pregnancy they become a familiar face somebody that is consistently able to understand what you're hoping to achieve and why so that you can let go of all of that the moment you go into labor you can offload the responsibility of your birth plan they become your walking talking birth plan and if you like I say if you do find yourself in a situation where a decision needs to be made they can help guide you through that process they're not there to give advice they're not there to um, push their thoughts and opinions onto you so you know if you wanted to have any particular type of birth they're there to say great how can I help you achieve that I have clients who have planned cesareans clients that have planned inductions they they want epidurals from the outset they really need help and support to achieve that so I can get in touch with the hospital on their behalf I can organize meetings that we can have together that really help them to um, get a personalized care plan in place something that they can really work with the medical professionals to achieve that birth I attend meetings with obstetricians talking about how you know they can um, support them through any high risk scenario that they may be experiencing to achieve as physiological birth as possible because of course that's the thing is that some women will be considered to be out of the scope of what is considered normal so they have to go against medical advice and yet that doesn't mean their body isn't capable of giving birth to their baby it just means they need a little bit of extra support to achieve that so doulas very much take on families that might be in that sort of situation but more and more we're supporting first timers who've heard about how beneficial it is to have a doula and how to get your first birth right from the outset because typically it's often the first birth that doesn't go well and doulas come in to support the second or subsequent and it doesn't always have to be that way that's brilliant and I actually a lot of the clients I teach I've seen that as well with first time um, parents having doulas now which I think is brilliant it's so good I think doulas are amazing and it's definitely one of the things that's in my like five-year plan I'd love to train as a doula as well Um, It's quite difficult with little kids around at the moment, (laughs) kind of getting that time, but I would definitely love to do that. So just one last question, but I think we might have covered most of it in your answer just now, but what are the main benefits of a doula, if you can think of of any more that you haven't said already? Well, the, the main one really is that familiar face and the continuity, having somebody that really understands exactly what you're hoping to achieve, because as you know, um, with hypnobirthing, it's a frame of mind, isn't it? It's about working on that subconscious and helping to to, um, change what your fears may have come from your own birth experience when you were born, that you that you have heard about many times from your your own parents about, you know, how things were, what you see on television, 
what your friends and colleagues tell you about their birth experiences that are so deep and buried within your subconscious that you are automatically on the back foot. You're automatically frightened. Having someone with you that gets you, that understands what you're hoping to achieve and bridges that gap from where you want to be to where you want to go with your birth and you take them with you and they support both you and your birth partner they know what's normal what's not normal they can look across the room and say this is great even if she's vocalizing and saying I can't do this anymore I don't want to do this anymore that doula can say you can you are because they're the strength that the other birth partner, the spouse, typically the spouse, may not have that courage. They've never seen birth before. And they are, you know, a little bit like a rabbit in a headlight scenario. Um, a doula has all the confidence in the world to keep that together for you and to help you to achieve it. So for me, that that's the be all and end all. It is the continuity somebody that arrives that's not going off shift that stays with you that knows you and that you recognize so that when you walk when they walk in the door your oxytocin rises your shoulders drop and you go ah, they're here they've got me well another benefit really is that they aren't emotionally attached to you whereas a spouse or a mom or a best friend would be have an emotional investment in you Whereas they don't, so they can give a much uh, kind of more subjective uh, view of what's happening and not so emotional. Um, I actually, when, so obviously here in the UK, when you have a, well, where I am anyway, when you have a home birth, you might not necessarily know the midwife that's going to be coming out. But my, um, so for my birth at home, I didn't know the midwives, but they were, they were lovely. But my community midwife, who I had had throughout my whole pregnancy, she came right as my baby had just been born. And I felt that um, this like, oh, you're here. And I was so happy to see her, even though I had already done it all anyway. I was just so happy to see a familiar face walk in the room thing. So yeah, I can definitely see the benefits of having that person who is that other kind of support for you. Well, thank you so much for coming and chatting. It's been so interesting what you've had to say. And I know so many people listening are going to find it so interesting because I get asked all the time about birth partners and, you know, things that they can do to broaden their knowledge. So where can people find you if they want to find out more about you, listen to your podcast, read your book, things like that? So my book is available on Amazon. Um, if you just type in Sally Ann Beresford or um, labor of love the ultimate guide to being a birth partner you can also purchase it from my website which is www.birthability.co.uk um, I have two Instagram accounts which um, feels a bit greedy but one is at birthability and the other is at the ultimate birth partner and then I have my podcast which is the ultimate guide to being a birth partner so please feel free to come and have a listen to those episodes and hear those golden nuggets of information that will support you and your birth partner throughout your journey, which I think is, is, is brilliant to be able to hear these things many, many times. You can never hear them enough. Um, and, you know, I, I would really say to anyone, invest in your birth experience because you only get each birth once and it's your job to make it the best birth you can yeah that's really good advice thank you thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and um yeah it's been great thank you thank you claire thank you bye, bye.